We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Alex Villarreal, here as usual with my co-host, Imran Siddiqui. Thank you so much, Alex. First up, it's presidential election season in Afghanistan, but will the transition happen peacefully? Fighting to save South Africa's rhinos, we hear from the VOA reporter who saw the work firsthand. Another Hollywood star's life cut short by apparent drug use. And in Uganda, mobile money, Africa's new way to pay. On Assignment is on the air. Stay with us. They've been dealing with more than a decade of war, and the challenges just keep coming. Afghans this year face a struggling economy, dwindling aid money, and the upcoming withdrawal of all international combat forces, not to mention the continued threat of Taliban insurgents. In April, voters will usher in the first government since the U.S. overthrow of the Taliban without Hamid Garzai as president, but power rivalries and lawlessness could make the election far from free and fair. On assignments, Philip Alexio talked with VOA's Sharon Bain about what Afghans are facing. Sharon Bain, the elections in Afghanistan will be in April 2014. What are the elections going to be like? They're talking about wanting these elections to be fair elections. Is that going to happen? I think that's really doubtful. I, you know, given, the, given how the country is right now, and given the security situation in large areas of the country where the militants are still in control, where people are being threatened, most people are saying this is not going to be one of those really purely free and fair elections and, and a, a fine example of democracy. That's not what's going to happen. The question is, will it be an election that's credible enough for the Afghan people to accept? And so since Karzai is not running again and he can't, and yet you're saying that he would like to have some sort of influence on the next person who ends up being elected. How much of an influence can he have on the election? Well, that's, that's a very good question. He, he actually, you know, the, the, the president is very powerful in Afghanistan. They, they nominate everybody all the way down to the ground level. Basically, he has power and influence over everybody who's nominated in every kind of government position. But as far as his influence over the election, again, it's all, it's all kind of, uh, it's a little bit fuzzy. I don't think okay. that having his backing is right. going to help any current candidate more or less than if they didn't have his backing. Mm -hmm. Karzai um, is not liked by everybody. He has a very tempestuous relationship with many of the, the powerful leaders, including some of the warlords. So it all depends on what the other candidates do and what they promise, and, and it depends who votes. You have the large urban centers, or, or that's what's expected to really sway the vote. The, the people who can vote in the large urban centers, that's where most of the population is now. So it depends how they sway the vote. The Loya Jirga is not the parliament. So, but we hear so much about the lawyer Jurga, right. but it's the parliament that has to maybe take those wishes and st stamp them yes or no, right. vote on them, and then the president, I guess, accepts them. I, I, explain that, yeah. that little trifecta there. I, I thought it was a really interesting thing, the lawyer Jurga. It comes from a sort of more historical, cultural, social, tribal uh, way of making decisions. They no longer meet in a tent. But in Afghanistan, the gathering of tribal elders to consult on major decisions is a tradition with deep historical roots. In Europe and the United States, reaching out to the public for their opinion is called a referendum. In Afghanistan, we have a tribal system, so we use the Loya Jirga as a form of referendum. This is our tradition. And then whatever decision they make would go to parliament for a vote. But it would be very difficult. They could, they can do it. They can vote against what the lawyer Jirga decided, but culturally it's not really acceptable. You know, you spent a lot of time uh, abroad, you've been in Afghanistan, you've been in Kabul. Give us an idea of what it's like. Yeah, Kabul is, uh, Kabul is a city in a sort of a saucer surrounded by hills. And uh, right now it has armed checkpoints everywhere. And there are big bases right in the middle of the ISAF, NATO bases right in the middle of the city. So it's high walls, barbed wire. Every, every house has high walls, barbed wire, armed guards, checkpoints everywhere. But it's, you can navigate it. You, know, there, you, you can drive around during the day. I drive around the day. I've driven around at night and it's been okay. Um, 
But you have to be a little bit careful. You, you don't, uh, I sort of dress down and, and I, I'm very quiet when I'm out in the street. You don't announce the fact that you're out you know, mm -hmm. trying to be a journalist. Well, do you have to go with any kind of security? I don't. I no. don't go with any security. I have, I work closely with the VOA's bureau there. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I have an absolutely normal car, regular driver. We drive around, we'll, we'll go, we'll stop in the market, we'll film in the market. I go with the cameraman, we'll film in the market, we'll do our interviews. And I've never had any problem. Having said that, recently, from when I first started going there a year and a half ago, it's definitely a little bit more tense. The, what people are telling me is that the Taliban are coming in from the countryside a little bit closer to the city. So it's a little bit more tense than it used to be. And during the Loya Jirga, which was the meeting of the tribal elders, it was, it was quite tense. Right. There was a lot of nervousness that the Taliban was very close. So that, you know, everybody actually came down quite a bit and the, the security was intense during that time. That was VA correspondent Sharon Bain. Making the situation even more complicated, the New York Times reports President Karzai has engaged in secret contacts with the Taliban about a peace agreement. Without his Western allies, the Taliban denies the claim. On out of South Africa, home to roughly 80 percent of the world's rhinoceros population, but 2013 was a very bad year for the more than 25,000 rhinos there. Almost 1,000 of the animals were killed for their horns, a 50 percent rise from the year before. A trade ban on rhino horns has been in place for decades, but the species may be losing the fight against extinction. Viewers Chris Simpkins went to a private game park in South Africa where the rhino is getting some protection. Our Rebecca Ward talked with him about the effort. Park ranger C.J. Lombard and his tracker Patrick Moriani are out on another game drive looking for rhinoceros. If you look carefully, you can see the front toenail, one side toenail, the other side toenail, and the heel. In this private South African game park, part of the larger Kruger National Park, Lombard and Moyani not only track rhinos, but search for poachers who want to kill the animals for their horns. This Kruger National Park region is one of the biggest areas and hotbed areas for poaching activity, animal poaching activity. So we saw some evidence of some dead elephants, some dead rhinos, and it's just hard to see such majestic mammals being slaughtered like that for their ivory tusk or for the rhino horns. And these animals are on the endangered species list, so they're protected, supposedly, worldwide. They have been, and rhinoceros have been protected since 1976, I believe. There's been an international trade ban, but that has not stopped the poachers or the value of their horns in Asian markets, where in some cases they're worth more than gold. Uh, a, a rhino horn can fetch about $60,000 for a kilo. But why is that? I mean, what is it about rhino horns that are so attractive? In rhino, it's a belief, basically, a belief mostly in Asian cultures where they believe that the rhino horn has some kind of medicinal value, that you can crush up the horn, and they think that it can cure things like cancer, arthritis, uh, stomach aches. But none of this is really true. It's keratin, the same type of protein that are made up in human fingernails, toenails, and your hair. Well, I, I wonder if, um, and I don't know if, if this could happen to rhinos, but I know in some cases in areas where there's a lot of poaching going on, they'll cut the elephant's tusk because an elephant can live without its tusk. Um, is that the, the true for rhinos' horns? Rhinos can live without their horns as well, but rhinos are so big and massive and very angry animals, so in order to get that horn, these poachers have to kill them. But uh, the other troubling thing is they will kill the mother, and you will see the baby calf there that will stay by its mother's side. They don't know how to get food, and then they starve to death. So a future generation rhino also doesn't survive. So you're not just killing one, you're killing others in the process. And this is a worldwide problem, not just for rhinos and elephants, but for other animals across the world. So uh, there is some kind of an international agreement, and I'm wondering how that's, how that's trickling down to the game reserves. Well, a lot of people have different ways about how to stop 
poaching, and I don't think any one way is the number one solution. But for instance, for the rhinoceros, they have been injecting poison at this particular game park that I visited and into each and every rhino in this park. Now, it doesn't ha harm the rhino, but they post signs across the park warning poachers that poison has been injected into these rhino horns. So if they take them and try to sell them on the black market, somebody crushes up the rhino horn and drinks it, they're going to get sick. And then there's another proposal. The South African government is asking for permission to go into a stockpile, a billion dollar stockpile of rhino horns they have sitting in warehouses. So that would be an effort to flood the market, hopefully bring down the price of the rhino horn and thus easing the, the poaching uh, that's going on. Now we were talking earlier, you did say this is your first trip to South Africa. It's a fascinating country with so much vastness and, and, the, and the area that we yeah, were we in, it's so enough. beautiful, especially in the summertime when I was down there, everything is turning green. And so you really feel that you are in the bush where I saw not only all of the big five mammals, the elephants, the rhino, water buffalo, lions, uh, but I saw hundreds of species of birds, uh, so many reptile, and, and this is their home, and you're seeing them in the wild. So I don't think that I could ever go to a zoo again and see these same animals. And our thanks to VOA correspondent Chris Simpkins. In particular, the population of black rhinos is now less than half of what it was 35 years ago. But some good news in the last 20 years. The number has been going back up, and it now stands at about 5,000. Well, it's time for a break now. When we come back, the tragic death of an American actor off the stage and screen. You're watching on Assignment. Hollywood lost one of its stars recently, Academy Award-winning actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. The 46-year-old was found in his New York apartment with a needle in his arm, dead of an apparent heroin overdose. Hoffman, who won his Best Actor Oscar for portraying author Truman Capote, was celebrated for playing characters pushed to life's edge, and he was open about his own struggles. VOA's Adam Phillips joins me right now. He's in our New York uh, bureau. Thank you so much for joining me, Adam. Pleasure. Uh, tell me something. What, what really happened with Philip and what's going on with this heroin thing? And what do you think, what kind of what kind of image does that leave on our society, especially those kids who watch these Hollywood actors and artists and performers and they look up to them? Well, what happened on a simple level with Philip Seymour Hoffman is that he was a, an on and off, on, on again and off again, uh, heroin addict. He was also had been addicted to, uh, to prescription medicine and he had a drinking problem at different points of his life. He'd gone to detox, but he had a very serious disease of drug, drug addiction. And uh, apparently he bought a lot of it uh, and, uh, and he, he injected too much of it in his veins and, and apparently have died from it. And it hasn't been definitively determined that it was heroin, but uh, that's what most people seem to think it is. That's what the police say. Yeah, because um, they found some packets of heroin uh, around there. But, you know, have you noticed that recently there's been a lot of celebrities uh, who've been, you know, uh, you know, getting killed by these drug overdoses? What do you think is going on there? Well, I think that uh, heroin abuse is a huge problem. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are addicted to this and other similarly difficult uh, opiates and other drugs. And I think celebrities are like other people. I mean, they might even have more inclination to become addicted because they have a very high pressure lifestyle. They've got a lot of money, so uh, there's no problem as far as paying for the drugs. And there's a sort of a cultural culture of hedonism and uh, that's very permissive in some ways, and perhaps they might uh, be attracted to it that way. That's all I could really say. Okay. Uh, actor and comedian Russell Brand, uh, who himself struggled with heroin addiction himself, he, he tweeted that Hoffman's death uh, uh, was, was, was tragic, but addiction kills. Uh, is there anything that, that's being done about helping these guys? But well, first of all, you gotta know that they're addicted, right? Yes, they know they're addictive, and then if they get it in time, they often go to de detox or rehabilitation, or they, which is often a residential setting where they, 
they, they sober up with people who are celebrities and people who aren't celebrities. They just share a common disease. And uh, But uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman did that also last May. He was in detox for 10 days, but uh, obviously he fell off the wagon again. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I could uh, get you to talk about Philip himself, and even in your piece, uh, his neighbors and the community that he hung out um, uh, at, you know, everyone kind of loved the guy. He was, a, he was a community guy. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, uh, he seemed to have a very huge, people had a very strong visceral impact, not just because they liked the movie characters or the, the Broadway roles that he played. I mean, he was a consummate actor. Everybody sort of agrees on that. But he was also a really nice guy, apparently. He mentored a lot of people. He was uh, unassuming. He had a kind of a quiet demeanor, a little bit eccentric, perhaps. But people felt, uh, people felt very warmly to him. And so his Greenwich Village neighborhood was kind of a sadder day. You know, people were stopping by and looking at the flowers, remembering him. Uh, the way, for example, he had built up this small little off-Broadway theater company near the house. And uh, how he, he seemed to care about people. And it was a, a personal loss for many. How can one cope up uh, with a situation like that? You're a celebrity, you're a star, uh, you've got this Hollywood fame, and then you have your own personal struggle that, you, uh, that, you, uh, that one goes through. How can one help individuals like, the, like these, like what happened to Hoffman or what happened to so many others in the past? Do you mean how can you uh, try to make it so that they don't use heroin or they don't continue to use it or don't use too much of it? Yeah. Well, I think that you need to promote a, um, a conversation within society where uh, it is recognized as a disease, where the stigma is lost, but that the health issue is emphasized, and, uh, and reach out to these people and give them support for living a kind of sober lifestyle that will help them to live a long time and, uh, and get off this stuff. Okay. And uh, how do you think people will remember Philip? I think they'll remember him as a a wonderful Your actor who was capable of many, many different kinds of roles, not just on screen, but on Broadway. I mean, he played a huge range of characters. Uh, the they'll sort of remember him, I guess, as a gentle guy. I mean, he was a family man, too. He lost, he had three daughters, and uh, all very young. And uh, I think that they will feel kind of a wince when they realize how his life and his potential was cut off so completely and so early. VOA radio and TV reporter Adam Phillips in New York, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. We're taking a break now, but on the other side, turning your mobile phone into an electronic wallet. You're watching On Assignment. In sub-Saharan Africa, most people can't access banks, so a new way has emerged to move money without them. And that's using a mobile phone. Right. In Uganda, mobile money service providers are rapidly expanding. And as VOA's Paul Indiho recently reported, providers like MTN are giving traditional financial institutions a run for their money. MTN Mobile Money is a virtual wallet on your cell phone. And it enables you to securely send and receive money using the device. And you can use that money at any participating store to make purchases or even withdraw cash. I was actually taken by surprise. I, I didn't know to what extent uh, mobile money has penetrated the country. Uh, you literally find it everywhere you go, especially in the cities, uh, let's say downtown Kampala. Every five meters there is uh, maybe two or five stalls just uh, uh, transacting business through mobile phones. And what's behind this trend? You know, you spent time, you're Ugandan yourself, your parents are even using the mobile money uh, system. So why are people turning to this rather than using traditional banks or other money sources? Well, uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, people are tired of uh, lining up at the banks. I tried going to the bank a couple of times and I was frustrated. Uh, if they don't know you, if you're not a regular client, it takes almost forever to get served. So I said, you know what, why bother with this uh, system if I can walk down the street and have a transaction done? Prosi, like many other people in Kampala, is a self-employed MTN mobile money vendor. She says that uh, mobile money is fast, secure, affordable and convenient and that it's right there in the palm of your hand. It is faster than the bank because you can take like less than a minute getting your money. So in a way, mobile money is doing what credit cards do for us over here. 
people, even in the villages, are using mobile money. So I, at first, I thought it was just a, a city thing. People in the cities use it. But when I went to the village, I was surprised to see that my parents were using mobile money to pay their, 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 their domestic uh, workers. I was like, wow, how does this work? And my dad was like, it's very simple. Instead of going to the bank every end of the month I to make payments for them, I just transact it right here in my living room. I don't have to go anywhere. And I, saw, I thought, I said to myself, I said, wow, what a way. Uh, this is technology, uh, how technology has transformed the economy, how technology has transformed the people, uh, even to the extent that the villagers know how to use mobile money. Mm. When you're out there, you know, you're walking around on a typical street, let's say in Kampala, about how many people would you say you see that are carrying cell phones? Interesting question. Uh, to tell you the truth, I think uh, what happened, the technology revolution or the cell phone revolution, was the best thing that could happen for Africa as a whole. Because uh, remember, for us, we didn't have the infrastructure. So what most countries did, they jumped that infrastructure phase and jumped straight to digital, uh, to digital technology. So the, the cell phones over there are more advanced even the cell phones that we have over here. You also have to understand that uh, commercial banks there are really scared. I think eventually, or sooner or later, they have to come up with ways of competing. Now, most of these people are running away from the banks, except for those people who are transacting huge sums of money. You still need a bank. If you're looking for a mortgage, you still need a bank. If you're looking for a loan, you still need a bank. But for small guys, you don't need a bank. Being from Uganda yourself and seeing this transformation that's taken place with the use of mobile phones, not just for mobile money transactions, but also for getting news. There are a variety of, of reasons that Africans are turning to their mobile phones more and more. What do you think that's done for not just Uganda, but the entire continent? What transformation have you seen? Uh, it's uh, a, a remarkable tra transformation, I would say, uh, because uh, we lived in a society that uh, was not advanced in so many ways. But uh, with uh, this advance in technology, I think uh, it has eased our communication, the way we talk to each other, the way we relate to each other, the way we even uh, market ourselves. Uh, the networks there uh, give the networks here a run for their money. Mm. Because you can literally talk to anybody, anywhere. They are all over the place. I didn't have issues with network connection when I was there. Mm. Uh, when I'm here, sometimes I'm driving and I drop calls. So it tells you that uh, there is something significant that has happened on the continent. All right, and again, our thanks to VOA English to Africa reporter Paul Ndiho. Africa has actually been leading the world in growth of mobile phone use up 550% in the past three years. Okay. That's a lot. That is a lot, yeah. but with that, we come to... I don't like this part of the show because I'm just about to say that we've come to the end of the show. But before we go, some exciting news. On Assignment is about to turn two years old. Yes, we are this happy month. Happy birthday I know, to happy show. birthday to us. Yeah. This month marks the second anniversary of our very first show, and every week we are so, so honored to be able to bring to light the backstories of our great journalists here at The Voice of America. And we want to thank you, the viewers, uh, who has made this possible. Without, without you guys, this wouldn't be happening. But next week, we'll hear about President Obama's agenda for Africa and a viewer special on the 50th anniversary of the Beatles coming to America. Yeah, it should be a good show. <laughs> In the meantime, though, if you miss us, you can check out On Assignment on the web anytime at voanews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. We will see you again next week.